Okay, this is part two of this chapter eight, sustainability. And this first slide, is, uh, as I was looking at, definitely one of the trickier slides that I've seen in this chapter. And this concerns sustainability versus efficiency. Here is our graph, and it's a two period model um, with declining marginal benefit in period one, declining as it goes from uh, left to right and then declining marginal benefit in period two as it goes from right to left. Now, goal of sustainability is welfare equity over time. We can call that intergenerational equity. However, there still exists the trade-off of efficiency versus equity. And as you know from basic economics, the more one pursues policies that promote efficiency, equity is sacrificed, and vice versa. Now this two-period model um, to the right shows the trade-off involved. And you can see um, <clears throat> consumption in period one versus period two. If it's equal, 50-50, um, then we have, we, we have the amount of consumption in period one exactly equal to the amount of consumption in period two. But the key is that there is a positive discount rate that decreases the present value in consuming in year two. So it's not as valuable to consume in year two. Thus, there is more consumption in year one and exceeds the um, equal division of 50%. If the, um, if the discount rate was zero, then there would um, consumption in period one versus period two would be equal and we would, we would be at the 50%. But because there is some present, some present value, we would value period two less than we would period one. And thus, in terms of efficiency, efficiency would be more consumption in period one relative to period two. And you can see dynamically efficient division there, um, greater emphasis in one relative to two. So generally, people will consume more today than they will indeed tomorrow. Now, I'll probably um, use this as a uh, discussion question when we get to this chapter. Okay, our next slides, I believe, are going to be a bit about recycling. Okay, walking the walk. Here's, here's some pictures of... Um, uh, various cotton t-shirts and why do we have cotton t-shirts because actually living a more sustainable lifestyle is much easier said than done the case of cotton um you know tradi um, traditional cotton farming involves the intensive use of toxic chemicals that it can include insecticides herbicides fertilizers and fungicides and it takes up to 2700 liters of water to grow the cotton for one t-shirt so it is not terribly sustainable at all. And so efforts towards sustainability require moderation in the use of products with a large environmental footprint. Cotton t-shirts would definitely fall in be the case. Efforts towards sustainability is nothing new. Um, you know, there, the, there's a National Policy Act of 1969 and then National Forest Management Act of 1976. Um, Agenda 21 of the 1992 um, UN Conference of Environment and Development. They all ask um, people and countries to be more sustainable. And yes, uh, so international statements of sustainability, that is the 1992 UN Conference of Environment and Development. Asked all participating countries to introduce national strategies for sustainable development. And, and in 2012, the UN Conference for Sustainable Development acknowledged the need to further mainstream sustainable development at all levels. Okay, so now recycling, what is it? And it's to make use good, to take used goods and to make them into new goods. So here we have a variety of scavengers collecting uh, plastic, metal, and food scraps. From a, uh, from a dump in Mumbai, India. 
Now, I think this is in on your page 199. Um, your book has the caption, but I don't think it has the right picture. And, I'm, and this is the picture here, and this is from, um, um, from version 4 of this book. Now, recycling and or sal salvaging trash is oftentimes looked down upon. So, you know, throughout history, um, politicians have looked down upon trash scavengers, but what they're really doing is recycling. Now, outlets for recycling are things like thrift stores, flea markets, garage sales, eBay, uh, and the like. We have lots of thing, lots of things to recycle, um, use goods into new goods all over um, all over Hawaii. Um, there are um, friends of Hawaii uh, um, bookstore um, basically takes recycled books and sells them back to um, to other folks. Um, your book has a great example about um, uh, a about carpets, most of the plastic, metal, glass, and paper removed from the waste stream can be recycled. Um, no, they don't talk about carpeting here, um, but they do talk about making trash into uh, treasure. Okay, current trends in recycling. 34% of um, USA waste is, um, is recycled, triple the rate since 1980. There's been a huge increase in curbside recycling as, uh, as well, which has caused recycling to increase dramatically. Ah, uh, but uh, what about China? So China, a year or so ago, uh, has stopped accepting many of our recycled goods. We used to send them to, to China and then China would recycle them back into products to be sent to, be sent to back to the Western countries, but China is not been doing that, and so that's dropped the market considerably for recycling. It's no longer quite as efficient. And that leads to the next question, recycling, is it efficient? So here we have a, there we go, here we have a, a graph showing units recycled, and we have um, a marginal benefit uh, the private margin benefit curve and the private marginal cost curve. And to get the optimal amount of recycling, society would want more. So this is a classic. Let's see if I have it here. Um, market prices for recycled goods are an adequate incentive for recycling. This is a classic um, uh, positive externality. So somehow there needs to be some kind of a subsidy to get the marginal benefit private up to the marginal benefit social, which would be um, MB private plus MEB. And I believe MEB would be some kind of per unit um, benefit, some kind of subsidy. The main thing is that uh, market prices do not reflect the social benefits of recycling. Now there's also the issue of um, imperfect information because people do not necessarily know the harm that is caused to the environment and society um, by um, throwing away things like paper or, um, or cans or bottles and things like that. Um, your book has a study, a synthesis of 70, 67 empirical studies on recycling behavior in 1995 found that consumer knowledge was one of the strongest predictors of recycling. Um, recycling rates in Pensacola, Florida tripled between 2010 and 2012 after an ambitious education campaign. So um, the market failure from recycling can result from imperfect information as well as externalities. Now the efficiency of, re of recycling can um, can increase with technology as well. Okay, there we go. Um, in the past, manufacturing plants have been logically clo located close to the source of virgin materials, which is often not so close to the source of recycled materials. In the future, manufacturing plants can be built closer to the source of recovered materials, New York rather than Oregon in the case of paper. Improving the efficiency of recycling of recycling heavy and bulky materials that are difficult to transport. And so it increases the, what we would call in economics, the transactions cost. 
Okay, so recycling different policies. One is called pay as you throw. And this is trash as an a la carte choice versus a fixed rate trash pickup. Um, so the idea here is if there's if trash is a fixed rate, then there is no incentive whatsoever to reduce the amount of trash that is being thrown out. But if trash is charged per um, uh, per unit as opposed to uh, fixed rate, people will reduce their trash um, their their trash the trash throwing away. Bottle bills. This is a deposit on recyclable cans and bottles. And, and so in, the, in this regard, the incent, there's an economic incentive to bring that bottle back, bring that can back, because you'll get a little bit of money. And uh, what, what, hap what happens, I know in, here in Hawaii, is that five cents is, is um, added on to the cost of any of any soda, so there's an incentive there to not buy as much. But also, if you do buy, then you you can uh, return those bottles in for um, for money. Okay, but there's a definite benefits to this. But there's also um, there's a reduction in total litter. But there's also perverse incentives. Um, yeah, patchwork of states with bottle bills can per, can do perverse incentives. Um, if there's other states that do not necessarily have the this bottle bill, there may be an incentive to buy more from the one that has um, has less um, deposits relative to the ones that have more deposits. Okay, looks like next to the last. Yeah, it could be next to the last slide here. Uh, broader policy, uh, policies towards sustainability. One is a natural capital depletion tax. So this would be a tax upon um, depletion of natural resources to maybe reduce the amount of depletion. Another one, very interesting one, is a precautionary polluter pays principle. This would be a bond posted by the polluter in case of damage into the future. So the person is putting an insurance, pol insurance policy up. If they, if, if they really deplete the resource, then they will pay, pay into the future the damage that was caused in the present. Very, uh, very, very interesting. Let's see what the book says. The idea is that those who take risks with natural resources would post a bond large enough to cover the best example of the worst case scenario for future environmental damages. And finally, we have um, something called ecological tariffs. And this would be on the international scene, um, can prevent short run competitive advantages of low standards and provide incentives for improved environmental standards. So basically, the countries that do have standards post a tariff on the countries that don't have standards to increase their price to hopefully incentivize them to have increased environmental standards. So tar tariffs can help environment even as it hurts the economy. And finally, we have a picture of a place called a permaculture village. Let's see. And it's a form of sustainable living. Gets its name from contractions of permanent and culture as well as permanent and agriculture. Um, so this is def definitely a trend to have less of a environmental footprint in agriculture activities. And this, my friends, ends chapter eight on sustainability.